Welcome back. Let's learn about unimolecular elimination reactions, also known as E1. In either type of elimination reaction, E1 or E2, the overall reaction looks pretty similar. We have a leaving group, abbreviated LG, and a hydrogen on neighboring carbons. They both break off and a new double bond is formed between those carbons. E1 does need to occur in the presence of a Lewis base, where E2 needed a strong base, but because they are so similar, people get these mixed up all the time. Another point of confusion when people are learning about all these mechanisms is that the very first step in E1 and SN1 are exactly the same. I do not want you to be one of those people who gets these mechanisms all mixed up, so let's learn about E1. Let's use this example to learn the mechanism. The first thing we need to do is to identify the leaving group. The leaving group is going to be in a polar covalent bond with a carbon, and it's going to be something that is more electronegative than that carbon. In this case, it's the bromine. Most of the time, the leaving group is a halogen, meaning something in group 7A of the periodic table. But this very first step that occurs is the rate determining step we see that the electrons in the bond between the leaving group and the carbon are going to be pulled more towards that leaving group. So we need a curved arrow from those electrons to this leaving group with two barbs because two electrons are moving. When this happens, that bond is going to break and we are going to form a carbocation. This is only going to actually occur if whatever carbocation we are left with is relatively stable, meaning this is most likely to occur if this is a tertiary carbon, meaning three other carbons bonded to it, one, two, three, because that's going to lead to the most stable carbocation. Now, in this second step, it needs to react with a lone pair of electrons on a Lewis base. So I'm just going to use water as an example. But what's going to happen is that a lone pair of electrons from this Lewis base are going to attack a hydrogen on this beta carbon. So remember, the carbon that the leaving group is attached to is an alpha carbon. Any carbon directly bonded to this alpha carbon is a beta carbon. So one, two, three. We have three of them here. This is a symmetrical molecule, so it doesn't really matter which one you pick. That's why it's an easy example. But I am going to have lone pair of electrons attack this proton. When that happens, a new bond is going to form between this oxygen and this hydrogen. That hydrogen is not going to like having two bonds. So at the same time, this bond is going to break. These electrons need to go somewhere. They are going to go towards that positive charge so that a double bond is going to form here. So this is the product. Carbon is back up to four bonds, one, two, three, four, so it is happy. Let's talk a little bit more about this Lewis base. Remember that a Lewis base is something that acts by donating a non-bonding pair of electrons. One point of confusion in E1 mechanisms is that a lot of times this Lewis base is just the solvent, and the solvent might be written above or below a reaction arrow, and a lot of people have gotten into the habit of just ignoring it, but it actually participates here. So another way of wording that it needs a Lewis base is that E1 mechanisms need a polar protic solvent. That's the same thing. Polar protic solvent means something that can form hydrogen bonds. So this example is a bit more complex because I want to teach you about regioselectivity and Zaitsev's rule. So this is 2-chloro-2-methylbutane. And when it undergoes an E1 reaction, there are two different products that are formed. So 
Chlorine is our leaving group. That makes this our alpha carbon. And we have three beta carbons. One, two, three. Now these two are equivalent. There are three hydrogens here, three hydrogens here. If any of those six hydrogens react, we will form one of our two products. There are also two hydrogens on this beta carbon. And if this site reacts, we have a different product. The difference is in the location of our double bond. Now, you might think that just statistically, we could choose from six hydrogens to make this product and two to make this product. And you might expect this to be a major product. That is not the case. So we need to follow something called Zaitsev's rule. I talked about it a lot in my E2 video, but the basic rule is the same here. The major product is the more substituted alkene. So we look at the alkene, meaning the double bond, and we count how many other carbons are bonded directly to these two carbons. This side is zero, this side is one, two. This is a di-substituted alkene. But looking here, we have one, two, three. This is a tri-substituted alkene. This is the more stable alkene that is going to make this the major product. What that means is there will be more of this product than this product. Now, I have some really great news for you about Zaitsev's rule in E1. Do you remember back in my E2 video when I spent about 15 minutes talking about all the different cases when Zaitsev's rule doesn't work? I don't have to do that here. In E1, Zaitsev's rule works most of the time. Now, there are some more advanced cases where Zaitsev's rule doesn't work, but it's involving things like carbocation rearrangement and kinetic control versus thermodynamic control, and we're not there yet. So for the purposes of this video, Zaitsev's rule actually works. So our examples keep getting more complex. The goal with this problem is to predict the major product. And the starting point is Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule works here, but the problem that we come up with is that there is a pair of stereoisomers and only one of them is the major product. So we know that the double bond is going to be between these two carbons according to Zaitsev's rule. Total number of other carbons bonded to these two carbons is one, two, three, four. If the bond had been here, it would have only been two. If the bond had been here, it would have been one, two, three. These are the most substituted alkenes. However, Zaitsev's rule does not help us figure out which one of these is the major product. And it turns out that this is our winner. The reason for this has to do with steric hindrance of that carbocation intermediate. So when you have a choice between cis-trans isomers, the major product of E1 most of the time is going to be when the big bulky groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. So in this case, it's a trans configuration. Whereas this minor product, the bulky groups are on the same side of the double bond. Notice that I said most of the time. Let's talk about when that is not the case. If there is only one hydrogen on the beta carbon, we are not going to get a mixture of cis and trans. We are going to have only one product. And that product does not follow that rule I just told you regarding steric hindrance. Let's take a moment to wrap our heads around this. This bromine is our leaving group. That makes this our alpha carbon. This is a beta carbon. This is also a beta carbon, but according to Zaitsev's rule, this is the bond that's going to form our major product. So this bromine and this hydrogen need to be in the anti-conformation. So I'm gonna draw a Newman projection, get out your molecular model kit if that's gonna help, but 
I am going to draw a Newman projection looking down this bond with this carbon in the front, this carbon in the back. So this circle represents our carbon in the front. Down into the right, we have a methyl group. Down into the left, we have this phenyl group. And straight up at the top, we have our hydrogen. This is our hydrogen that's going to react. Carbon in the back, you just see the bond sticking out at the side. Straight down, we have the bromine. Up into the right, we have a hydrogen. Up into the left, we have a methyl group. So this leaving group and this hydrogen on our beta carbon need to be 180 degrees apart. That's anti-conformation. And this is the only geometry in which this reaction is actually going to occur. So if we had more than one hydrogen on this beta carbon, that means this bond could rotate into any orientation. There's more than one conformation that can react. But we only have one hydrogen that can react. It has to be in this particular conformation. So when this mechanism occurs, this bromine is going to leave. Something is going to come and take this hydrogen. Those electrons are going to jump to this carbon-carbon double bond. When that happens, double bond is going to form here. This is just going to snap into whatever conformation is the closest. When this is an alkene, when this is a double bond, these two carbons are going to be trigonal planar, so we'll have a big section of this molecule that is a flat plane. Let's look at the molecular model of the same molecule. It's right now in the same orientation as my original drawing and has a lot of the same colors. So this orange is my bromine leaving group. That makes this my alpha carbon. We have two beta carbons, and yes, these hydrogens can react to make a double bond here, but that is our minor product. This hydrogen is the one that would react to form a double bond here and make our major product according to Zaitsev's rule. I did cheat a little bit and put my giant phenol ring as just a blue ball because it was getting too bulky and confusing. But Newman projection was drawn from this orientation. Yes, when this is a single bond, it can rotate. But in order for the reaction to actually occur, the leaving group on this back carbon and the hydrogen on this front carbon need to be 180 degrees apart. Bromine leaves, something takes this hydrogen, and electrons go to make this single bond a double bond. These carbons were originally tetrahedral geometry. They are going to switch to trigonal planar geometry. And when that happens, big phenyl group and this methyl group are going to snap into the same plane. Likewise, this methyl group and this hydrogen are going to snap into the same plane. So we would be left with the big phenol ring and this methyl group on the same side as this double bond. So the largest group on this carbon is this phenyl group. The largest group on this carbon is this methyl group. So our front carbon, this is our phenyl group. Our back carbon, this is our methyl group. When these two groups are 180 degrees apart with this particular stereoisomer, these are only 60 degrees apart. They have to either snap 60 degrees into the same plane or they have to make a much bigger change so that they are trans from each other. It's going to go with that 60 degree direction. So in this case, the largest group on this left side is the phenyl group. The largest group on this right side is the methyl group. They are on the same side. This is not a case of this being a major product and the other stereoisomer being the minor product. No, in this case, this is the only one of these stereoisomers that is actually going to form 
because we have to have this dihedral angle of 180 degrees. Now, imagine what would happen if this was a different isomer. Just flip this phenyl group and this methyl group, you would actually end up getting the trans product. So you really need to be careful with situations in which you only have one hydrogen on that beta carbon. So let's say you're looking at some reactants and you need to decide if E1 or E2 is more likely to occur. The first thing you should do is classify that alpha carbon. If it's a primary carbon, primary carbocations are extremely unstable and that means E1 is not going to occur. It's going to be E2. If it's a secondary carbon, we get into a little bit of a hairy situation. Some textbooks will say it has to be E2 because secondary carbocations are unstable. Other textbooks will say E2 is much more likely because it's harder to get E1 to happen. But if it's a tertiary carbon, either E1 or E2 can happen. But in both that secondary and tertiary state, what tips the scales is the base. To understand why, let's look at the rate laws for both E1 and E2 reactions. So remember that the concentration of reactants in the rate determining step are what show up as concentrations in the rate law. And E2 has concentration of base in the rate law. That means we can make E2 happen faster if the concentration of the base is a lot higher. So E2 is favored if it's a strong base with a high concentration. E1 is favored if it's a weak base with a lower concentration. So let's look at this reactant. I didn't specify what all is bonded here, but the important thing is that this is something that can form a carbocation with this leaving group leaving. That is the first step of both SN1 and E1 mechanisms. And these mechanisms can deal with the same solvents and bases. It is entirely possible that you will be in a situation where both of these mechanisms can occur at the same time. You can end up with both nucleophilic substitution product and elimination product. But you can control which of these products there is more of by controlling the temperature. So the SN1 mechanism predominates at lower temperatures, meaning like room temperature, and E1 is going to predominate when heat is applied. So remember that the abbreviation for heat being applied to a reaction is a capital delta being written at the reaction arrow. So if heat is applied, E1 is going to predominate. So if you are in a situation where E1 can't occur or is less likely to occur, you need to start thinking about what can occur instead. Thanks for watching Chemistry in a Nutshell. If you feel that I've earned it, please like this video and subscribe to my channel.